Hi everyone and welcome. Um, my name is Lorenz de Meij and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Philosophy here at KU Leuven, where I teach and do research on a number of different topics, the most important one of which is definitely logic, philosophical logic. Now, like all philosophers probably, from time to time I like to ask difficult questions. And one of the most difficult questions that you can probably ask is a uh, what is question. For example, already in ancient Greece, Plato asked questions such as what is goodness or what is philosophy? Now the question that I happen to be particularly interested in is the question what is logic? And one of the reasons why this is such a difficult question I think is that logic is a highly interdisciplinary um, area, field of research. It has connections, applications in a variety of disciplines. Philosophy, of course, but also areas such as mathematics, computer science, linguistics, um, psychology even. And we'll have time later to talk a bit about those applications. But of course, as you can imagine, um, this interdisciplinarity means, of course, that all these people from all these different fields are going to look at logic with their own background, with their own set of motivations, their own expectations. And they're going to have they're gonna have their own opinions on what logic is about, or at least should be about. So despite this um, wide variety of opinions, I do think that there's kind of a, a common core as to what logic is about, a common core that all these people, despite their differences, would be able to agree about. And this common core, I think, has to do one way or another with reasoning. Logic is about reasoning, about arguments, about good arguments and distinguishing them from bad arguments. Okay? In logic, we would say distinguishing valid arguments from invalid arguments. Now, before we continue, I think it's important to note that there's a wide variety of arguments. Okay? Um, there's the three most important types of arguments probably are deductive, abductive and inductive arguments. To illustrate these three types, I'm now going to give you three sentences and depending on which of these sentences you take to be the premises of your argument and which one you take to be the conclusion, the argument that you're going to end up with is going to be either a deductive, an abductive or an inductive argument. Okay, so let's start with a deductive argument. So it goes as follows. All swans are white, Lida is a swan, therefore Lida is white. This is a prototypical example of a deductive argument and we will have much more to say about it uh, later on. But look what happens when we swap around um, the conclusion with one of the premises. Then we get an argument that sounds as follows. We know that all swans are white. We observe this animal here, Lida. She is white. Now how can we explain her whiteness? Well, we can explain this by making the assumption that Lida is a swan. After all, we know that swans are white, so if we assume that she's a swan, then we can perfectly explain our observation that she's white. Finally, as for an inductive argument, um, we have this animal here, Lida. We see, that she, we see that she is white. We also see that she is a swan. So in total, that means Lida is a white swan. Now, Ideally, of course, next to Lida, the white swan, there's also going to be hundreds or even thousands of other white swans around. And based on all these premises describing all these white swans, we're going to get to the conclusion all swans are white. That would be an example of an inductive argument. Okay? Now, um, today I really want to focus on deductive arguments, okay? And what sets deductive arguments apart from all other arguments, what is really specific for them, is that in a deductive argument, the premises provide a 100% guarantee for the truth of the conclusion, okay? So what it means for a deductive argument to be, um, what it means for an argument to be deductively valid is that whenever the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true as well, okay? So you've probably heard me now characterizing, defining the notion of deductive validity using the word truth, okay? truth of the conclusion. It's important to keep in mind, however, that when I talk about the truth of the conclusion here, I do not mean that the conclusion simply has to be true in this world, in the actual world, as a matter of fact. Rather, what I mean is that the conclusion has to be true given the hypotheses, given the truth of the hypotheses. Okay? So it's conditional truth, not factual truth, so to speak. So um, now I would like to move to the first um, concrete system of logic, namely propositional logic. And there's two reasons for that. There's two reasons for starting with propositional logic. 
The first one is that propositional logic is a very basic system, very easy to understand, easy to grasp, so it's good to start here. But secondly, it will also allow me to make this point about um, deductive validity having to do with conditional truth rather than factual truth. Um, it will allow me to illustrate and explain this point once more in a very concrete fashion. So let's first start with propositional logic. What is propositional logic about? Well, um, like all of logic, propositional logic is about assessing the validity of arguments. Um, propositional logic focuses on valid arguments where the validity has to do with, arises from, um, the propositional structure of the premises and the conclusion. So in propositional logic, we are going to focus on a number of um, propositional connectives, the most important ones of which are probably conjunction, disjunction, implication, and negation, which um, in natural language we would um, describe using words such as and, or, if, then, and, not, and which are symbolized in logic using the symbols that you can see right now. So take a sentence, for example, such as Max is a dog and Zazzles is a cat. What propositional logic is going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to focus on, to zoom in on the conjunction, the end that's in the middle of the sentence. So we're going to treat the two sub-sentences, Max is a dog and Zazzles is a cat, as units, as black boxes, and we're going to represent them using letters, P and Q, and then the conjunction and we are going to symbolize with the symbol that we just introduced. Okay? Now, keep in mind that the sentence Max is a dog itself also has a kind of structure, an internal structure, internal to the proposition, to the sentence. Namely, the predicate dog is being ascribed to the proper noun, to the subject max. However, in propositional logic, we do not care about such internal structure. Okay? We treat the proposition as if it were a black box. There is some structure going on inside the proposition, but we simply don't care about it. Okay? We only care about the structure, the connectives between propositions. Now, of course, propositional logic is not just about sentences. It's about doing something with these sentences, namely making arguments. So these sentences are going to be premises or conclusions of arguments. So let's have a look at a prototypical example of an argument in propositional logic. The argument goes as follows. If it rains, then the street gets wet. It is currently raining. Therefore, conclusion, the street is going to get wet. In propositional logic, this would be formalized as follows. P implies Q, P, therefore, conclusion, Q. Okay? Now, this argument is a very famous argument. It's called modus ponens in propositional logic, and it's a good example of an argument that is deductively valid. Okay? So, remember, deductive validity means if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. So, what does this mean in the context of this particular example? To see this, let's make a truth table for this argument. I assume many of you are going to be familiar, at least to some extent, with the notion of a truth table. So let's make a truth table. First, I'm going to write down the, sentence, the sentences in this argument, the premises and the conclusion. Um, then I'm going to put up front all of the letters, P and Q in this case, that, hap that happen to occur somewhere in the premises or the conclusion. We have two such letters. P and Q, so in total there are four possibilities that we have to consider, right? P and Q can be either true or false, so either both of them are going to be true, one of them is going to be true and the other one false, or the other way around, or final and fourth possibility, both of them are going to be false. And then it's just a matter of filling in the truth table. So for the second premise, simply which is simply P, we can just copy-paste the column that we already have. So we just copy-paste it, and similarly for the conclusion. So that's no big deal. Now, for the first premise, that's a material conditional. And a conditional is standardly taken to be true in all situations except for one, namely the one that you see on the second row, where the first part of the conditional, in this case P, is true, and the second part of the conditional, in this case Q, is false. So now we have a fully completed, a fully filled in truth table for this argument. And one of the things I would like you to notice is, suppose that currently it is not raining and the street is not getting wet. That means currently we are, so to speak, situated in row number four, in the bottommost row. And as you can see, in the bottommost row, the conclusion of this argument is actually false. There is a zero there. 
Okay? So despite this argument being deductively valid, the conclusion is false. So this shows that deductive validity does not have to do simply with the conclusion being true. Rather, it has to do with the conclusion being true given the premises. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we want to assess the deductive validity of an argument, we don't have to look at all the rows in the true table. We just have to look at the rows in which all of the premises are true. So, for example, the second row can be discarded because the second row, in the second row, the first premise is false. So that means not all premises are true, so irrelevant when assessing um, deductive validity. Similarly, the third and fourth row can also be discarded because in those two rows, the second premise is false. So what we're left with is just a single row, namely the first one. By the way, it's just a coincidence that we're left with just a single row. We could also have... Um, been left with two or three rows, but the idea is we are left with a number of rows, one in this case, all of which make all the premises um, true. And now what deductive validity means is that if you look at just those rows, namely those rows which make the premises true, then all of those rows, that is 100% of those rows, are going to make the conclusion true. And as you can see in this argument, that is indeed the case. There's just a single row that makes the premises true, and it indeed makes the conclusion true. And that is exactly what accounts for the deductive validity of this modus ponens argument. In general, there's a very strong tendency to focus on deductive arguments, deductive reasoning. And this is all very well, but I think that um, in everyday lives, um, deductive logic, deductive reasoning doesn't play such an important role. What plays a more important role um, in everyday life, I think, is um, other kinds of reasoning. For example, abductive reasoning. So, for example, consider the following. Um, oh, wait a minute, there's someone at the door. Oh. Actually, what just happened is also a very nice example in and of itself of an abductive argument. Consider what just happened. I know that when someone knocks at the door because of the laws of physics, how my ears work, acoustics, etc., that when someone knocks at the door, I will hear a typical uh, knocking sound. And I just heard that typical knocking sound. So, um, a good explanation for this would be assuming that there is indeed someone at the door and that I should go get it. And this is a typical example of an abductive argument. Now you might wonder, is this really going on in our heads? Isn't this very abstract, very difficult? Um, but I think you should keep in mind that this does happen inside our heads, but usually it doesn't happen in as much complexity as I just described it. Usually it happens in the blink of an eye, in a split second, we hear the knocking and immediately we go and get the door. And I think that's a very good thing. After all, typically when somebody's at the door, we don't want to keep them waiting as long as I just did. Excuse me, for Professor, are you busy? No, 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 come in. I was just explaining abduction. Mm -hmm.